How has the online consumer changed over the last year? What are the signals that we have to pay attention to? And how do we adjust our marketing tactics to meet their needs? The world's been in a pressure cooker for a bit, and we need to market accordingly. Learn today here on The Edge. Go! Your weekly digital marketing trend with industry trend-setting guests. Powered by your digital marketing pioneers, Site Strategics. This week's featured guests are J.D. Prater, Head of Marketing at Osmos, and Joe Martinez, co-founder of Paid Media Pros. Now, here's your host, Aaron Sparks. This is Edge of the Web Radio. I'm your host, Aaron Sparks. Every week, we bring you amazing guests to chat about digital marketing news and topics. Each week, we unpack a key marketing topic for our digital marketing audience. So whether you're part of an agency, a freelancer, or part of a firm, this show is for you. So check out everything over at edgeofthewebradio.com. All the shows, content, social, and much more over at edgeofthewebradio.com. Edge of the Web is brought to you by our title sponsor, Site Strategics. We're the pioneers in the agile digital marketing methodology. Our core specialties are SEO, SEM, social media, marketing and management, conversion rate optimization, omni-channel, media marketing, agile marketing that actually is results-based marketing that works. So if you're interested in what we can do for you, just give us a call at 877-SEO for web or 877-736-4932. I almost missed it. Just want to let you know who will be coming up on the show over the next few episodes. Olga Zardeshna, uh, Christina Azarenko, and Darren Shaw. Be sure to check out the recent shows we've had with Garrett Sussman, Bill Slosky, and Mark Traphay again. Those are fantastic shows. Certainly uh, dug into a lot of great topics uh, over the last few weeks. If you're interested in being part of the show, simply drop us a line at info at edgeofthewebradio.com. Uh, set your reminders for YouTube to get notified when we post the videos of this show. Each video is actually the full interview. Make sure you check out all the weekly news podcasts as well covering the most uh, recent digital marketing news and Google updates. We're dropping it every Tuesday uh, to help you navigate the week in digital marketing. And continued uh, co-host on the show is the indomitable Mar Marty Oberstein. So check us out and see how he abuses me each and every week. Now let's meet this week's industry expert guests. All right, so it, it's a continued pleasure to introduce our most more recent listeners to these gentlemen I'm about to speak with today. Uh, we've had them on both individually over time, a couple times each uh, for J.D. Prater and Joe Martinez, and uh, we certainly would like you to go back and look at those interviews and listen to those interviews, I should say, uh, because there's a lot of great information that kind of ties into what we're talking about today. These guys are buds and wanted to get them together uh, to talk about their efforts in digital marketing and the platforms that they work on. Um, there's this new embrace of diversification inside the platforms by clients and agencies alike, and these guys see that regularly. So let's introduce JD again. JD is a head of marketing over at Osmos, and he also hosts Thrills and Chills, a product marketing podcast, and he's interviewing some top minds in uh, product marketing and product management. He's got his finger on the pulse of product marketing. He's also a seasoned product marketer that excels at go-to-market strategies. Uh, he's got a career path of ad stage, uh, Quora, Google, Amazon uh, services, where he was the global head of product marketing. And now, Osmos, JD, thanks for joining us again on the show. Ah, excited to be here. And, uh, you know, always good to see Joe again. You say that now because he's here, but I know I know what you were saying before, you, before he got here. <laughs> <laughs> We, we keep that in storage just for uh, blackmail use later down the road. All right, so Joe Martinez is the the uh, other gentleman here that we want to bring over. He's an international paid media writer and speaker, and he was the director of client strategy over at Clicks Marketing and previously was with Granular and Top Floor Technologies. He hosts a killer YouTube channel uh, with Michelle Morgan called Paid Media Pros, and they do a incredible job breaking apart ad platforms and not just concepts, not just strategies, but the tactical execution of audience marketing and segmentation and the like. And uh, I cannot give you enough kudos on all the different channels. If you look at the playlist, it is literally, they did develop this as almost a training guide on each platform. They deep dive into all the different channels. The playlists are very well cultivated to learn deep into every, every area. So there's the brown nosing for the day, uh, Joe. Thanks so much for giving that type of content out there on a regular basis. You're, you're truly educated our own team as well. Thank you, Aaron. I 
It's great to be back. It's just odd to not be there in person. I know you're you're supposed to be right here, man. Yep, first time not in person, which is weird. That is weird. It is weird. Yeah, yeah. Joe, but if, Joe's been. But if JD can it. join, then I'm always a happy boy. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, you're, yeah, we had to get a hold of your boo to be able to make sure that. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, you were. Bro, you're, you're, romance you're, is real. It's not just a Twitter <laughs> thing. Uh, like I said before, <laughs> exactly. Uh, you got to watch these guys on Twitter. It's pretty damn funny. Uh, but uh, on top of that, you got to check out uh, Martinez's Star Wars collection. I, I went long describing it in the first episode, but super geek, super fun, and uh, I'm super in awe of the, the the stuff that you turn up there. It's it's crazy good. And as a Star Wars fan, I am humbled in your presence. You realize that, right? I mean, a big portion of it, you have to blame quarantine. I was. I was very bored, so I, I really dove in the deep end on that one. So, uh, you know what? What a great segue, because this is what I wanted to talk about here, is everybody's consumption patterns changed uh, over over the quarantine and the pandemic over the last year and a half. And it's not over for any stretch of the imagination. We have realized that there's a consumer behavior shift that's sticking and uh, I mean, lockdowns and social distancing shifted consumer habits and demands. Uh, people are becoming more self-sufficient, consuming as much Star Wars as they possibly can, as, as well as embracing different digital trends. So uh, according to Bizarre Voice, 49% of global consumers now shop online more than they did before the pandemic. In the US, 62% of consumers shop more online than ever before. Uh, and a research at, from McKinsey's found that 75% of American shop Shoppers change their shopping behavior and brand preference amid the actual pandemic. And even more interesting, uh, more than 60% plan to stick with those buying habits post-crisis. So there's the tee up, gentlemen. Buying brand perception, buying perception has indelibly changed uh, via the pandemic. We got put in our houses, we were closed up, and all we had was the internet, right? Well, <laughs> Amazon. Uh, it, it benefited incredibly so. Uh, so did a lot of digital brands that were able to pivot. What have you witnessed over the last year and a half? Joel, I'll go to you first on uh, some of the behavior uh, that you witnessed on consumers that kind of dropped your jaw and uh, give us maybe a possibly a couple examples of that. Yeah, I, I think the, the first one that, that comes to mind for a couple of our clients that I had at this point last year or not last year yeah yeah last year 2020 um was, blur, man yeah right it totally is <laughs> but uh we noticed that quote the unofficial black friday started even earlier than it did uh, you tell people were just buying earlier and it not in terms of companies purposely putting out the, their deals or their offers it's just we saw a big spike in even like the the late september early October. Mm -hmm. And there was still, you know, another spike for some of the clients around the, the actual Black Friday time. But some of their biggest sales were well before that, because it, people were still locked down, they were still bored. And sometimes the companies had to do some additional sales and, and deals that they weren't planning just to kind of boost business and try to meet some some goals for the quarter in the year. Right. So from that user behavior aspect, it changed. And then from whether you're e-commerce or not, you know, we actually got to loosen the reins a little bit. I'm looking at particularly some Google ads accounts on the ad scheduling. Mm -hmm. People were stuck at home and a lot of our non-e-commerce accounts sticking their Google ads just to like the actual weekday business hours. Sure. Well, where people were stuck at home, they weren't going anywhere on the weekends. People were still buying on the weekends yeah. and the cost per conversions were just as good, if not better on the weekends. So we could go from the, just the business hours to 24 hours a day and, hmm. and all seven days a week and let it run. And that's how some clients could grow or just kind of spread the budget around a little bit more and right. see some benefits from it. So from, from that aspect, we, we definitely discovered user behavior for sure changed in many of our accounts. Absolutely. JD, what are your thoughts on uh, what you saw from uh, user behavior with the clients that you've worked with in the past year? Yeah, I mean, I'd uh, echo Joe's. I mean, I think uh, someone called it a blurs day, right? Where, I mean, <laughs> everything is just blurred together. So uh, yeah, I 100% agree with Joe. Uh, I, yeah, Monday through Sunday, they all feel the same, right? Uh, if you're not, you know, work or if you're working from home and you're just not really getting out, right? Then you've got discretionary funds, 
right? You've got more money maybe because you're not doing certain activities. Maybe it's the family vacation that you didn't take. Mm. Maybe it's eating out a little bit less or maybe eating out more depending on your uh, situation there. But I think uh, another trend that isn't going to go away is it's going to be earlier. I mean, just look at, go look at Walmart. I mean, it is what, July? Mm. I bet they're prepping for Halloween yep. starting next month, right? Absolutely. I mean, everything is going to be earlier and earlier because everyone's going to want that share of wallet. I mean, I want your money. You only have so much of it. There are so many D to C brands. Now Shopify has made that so easy. Mm -hmm. I got to get in early. And I think that'll be something that uh, brands will try to do as they, uh, you know, approach black Friday is now going to be just like a whole month. All right. So it's going to be November. And I think it's going to creep into October. So I think those <laughs> all make sense to me. I think all those trends and I even look at my own behavior. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like I could go to the store or I could have it uh, on prime and uh, maybe tomorrow, maybe two days. Right. It's crazy. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I'll wait. You know, it's like, I don't really want to go into a store or just the whole, like, you know, for me. Know. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, we, we were uh, talking to uh, like, well, Fernando, <laughs> Fernando Angulo over at SimRush, and uh, one of the biggest trending topics of 2020, they did a big honking infographic um, at the end of the year there, and one of the biggest trending fashion uh, uh, topics were sweatpants. I don't want to get out of my sweatpants to go down the street and perhaps get a deadly virus. So, yeah, <laughs> I mean, comfort plus panic uh, all of a sudden pushes us into a much different buying space here. So, uh, what well, we're going to be looking at Q4? Uh, are we just going to be celebrating Q4 as a buying holiday from now on? It's going to expand that that much. So it's <laughs> that's it. We're just going to market around that. Well. <laughs> Something about some of the stats I was reporting there, uh, it's not just about buyer tra uh, just transactions, but it was also about brand alignment. Over the period of time here, consumers thought more of the brand's messaging, not just the transactional nature. So uh, that, that study showed that a healthy percentage actually decided to go to different brands or consider brand messaging and alignment more in this period of time. So it's not about just getting the lowest dollar... Uh, product out there, but who you are, what you are. And there's a lot of brands that weren't ready for that type of nuanced approach, or I should say that there's challenges if you haven't done true marketing messaging to then all of a sudden try to create your brand overnight. Right, guys? Yeah. I mean, I, I can see that um, even in my own buyer behavior mm -hmm. of like what I'm buying, it matters maybe a little bit less of what brand that is. Uh, maybe what's more important to me now is when can I get it? Um, you know, as we talked about earlier with the one day or the two day, right? Mm -hmm. um, so maybe, you know, I've got a, a little toddler. Um, he's two and a half and it's like, oh, Huggies aren't in stock. Okay, I'll, I'll go buy Pampers, right? Oh, Pampers aren't in stock. Okay, cool. I'll go buy the Amazon Basics, right? Yep. I, I just... I don't really care. I just need diapers, right? And I think for me, it came down to more around need, not necessarily being truly loyal to that brand and having to wait uh, because maybe they have logistics issues or mm -hmm. maybe the Suez Canal is still blocked and they're, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, and they're yeah. still messed up from that. I was talking to a local retailer um, and he's like, yeah, I can't do boba tea. Uh, it's going to, I'm backed up like three months. And I was like, dang, Really? Like from the Suez Canal thing. So like that's going to have ripple effects. Yep. And that's ultimately going to affect my buyer behavior when I just want the product without leaving the comfort of my basement office here. Damn it. Get JD his boba tea. Come on. <laughs> I need my boba tea. And I need my diapers. <laughs> okay. That right there, I want to have as a sound bite. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There it is. There um, it is. So, uh, so that's that's the, the the converse of that is that you know consumers damn the brand where they were being wooed and persuaded before that it was much much more transactional they, and there are more offerings out there and part of the product manufacturer and, and, and marketing mindset would be get that out there as best as you can uh, in all the different channels but there was also brand sensitivity over the course of the last year and a half. Yeah. There's certainly advertising that had to be pulled from certain types of causes, messages that we hadn't really noticed before or hadn't stubbed our toe on it nearly or clearly as much as a lot of advertisement around certain uh, political issues, right? 
I, I could jump on that one. I say def, definitely. And even as the channels have cracked down, it's affected, I, I could assume, a majority of advertisers, hopefully, uh, I'm not hope I'm not wishing on this, but I know other people have talked about online where their account or their client's account has nothing to do with a controversial topic. However, since the channels have cracked down, they've done more machine learning to yep. try to flag these actual bad accounts. It's affecting a lot of legit good accounts because the machine learning isn't perfect. And then you have to constantly go back to support or have them review requests to, to get your accounts or your ads back online. Mm -hmm. We've run into that and we are still running into that consistently um, because they've had to really crack down on it. Because look how many accounts are on there, especially with how Google wants to grow with small businesses. Sure. There are just way too many accounts out there to have a manual support team to help you do this. So they, they need the machine learning to try to stop all the bad advertisers out there, which I get it, you know, they have to do it, but at the same time, it's affecting everybody. And that's something that I think we're just going to have to constantly deal with. Well, it was almost like we had two different pandemics happening at the same time, the physical one and the, the, the political or the social cause pandemic and the heightened hyper reactivity to messaging. So steerage for companies uh, in their in digital marketing is even, you have to be more attuned to all the third rails that are out there. And, and we had certainly some, some assistance from Google and Facebook, but even that, are they approaching a level of heavy handedness? We just had one campaign that our ad campaigns got smacked. We were trying to prevent uh, domestic violence, right? And to try to get that message through the locks and channels on Facebook, it was ungodly. And mm -hmm. all the hoops that we had to jump through, there is something about being too hypersensitive to messaging from these platforms uh, that it, it doesn't make it worth its while to actually get the message out. Yep, a little bit. I know one of the, you know, JD kind of just said one of the main reasons he buys is convenience and can I get it now? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we've had one of the biggest reasons we've seen clients or clients grow is that they build brands that people fall in love with. You know, people will constantly come back to a brand that they can relate to, that they agree with. Mm -hmm. So with that mentality, We've had a couple clients who have publicly come out with some of these controversial topics and say, this is where we stand mm -hmm. because they know their audience backs them up. And when their audience backs them up and they know that they're vocal and they're, they feel confident doing that and not be afraid to do it, it empowers <laughs> the audience who wants, who wants to buy from that brand. So they, they can do that as a marketing tactic as well to say like, we are the brand that is in your corner that you can relate to, builds more trust in some cases that it can actually help your business. Yeah. And you have other brands that jump on the uh, lightning topic just for the controversy sake of it. So mm -hmm. I mean, back to the concept here is that brand alignment is not for the faint of heart anymore is you got to be able to be strong or, or uh, in whatever direction you take, you can't tread tepidly because even that is a signal that uh, consumers can process incorrectly now. So there's a whole nother beast right there. So consumers have certainly changed here. Are you seeing this behavior staying? We're proud to have Wix as a sponsor for our Edge of the Web interview podcast series. They're always building, so check out what's happening on Wix. URL customization on Wix is now available on product pages. You can now customize URL path prefixes and even create a flat URL structure if that floats your boat. Plus, Wix automatically takes care of creating 301 redirects for all impact URLs. Full rollout is coming soon. Visit wix.com forward slash SEO to learn more. Wix, always evolving. Yeah, I think we're going to see like a more inclusive messaging with our marketing. And I think that's great. Mm -hmm. um, it's just whenever it misses the mark or you're trying to do something too much. An example, this last week, uh, an Oklahoma City newspaper was trying to, you know, get people vaccinated and their marketing message was, there's nothing more rock and roll than getting a needle. Okay. <laughs> uh, you couldn't be so, more true. <laughs> you're like, um... So people were responding like, hey, man, like, you know, overdose is real. You know, oh so my and God. they just doubled down on it. Right? right. And they eventually, you know, bosses had to come in. People got let go. Right. And they had to issue an apology. Right. And Jeez. 
But you see, they're trying to jump onto something. They were trying to do the right thing, mm -hmm. but it's just when you don't own it. And I think that's part of what we're seeing too. I think we're going to see more inclusive, but we're also going to see more ownership of our messaging mm. and to say in holding uh, you know people accountable, not necessarily like canceling. I mean, the brand isn't canceled, sure. right? Uh, but when you double down on the wrong thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. You might get canceled, right? Yeah, and so yeah. I, I think it's really coming down to the accountability of the canceling of like, hey man, like that was really insensitive, right? And yeah. so I'm not saying that we're a bunch of snowflakes, but I, I do think there is a time, and I think we're starting to see it now, where um, we gotta be more inclusive with our marketing. This is the messaging, this is the perception, this is who is in there, you mm -hmm. know. Um and really start to think through those things because we want to ultimately reflect our own values, but also who our customers are. We want our customers to feel seen as yeah. well. Quick question here is uh, within Facebook and the uh, Google ads platform. Now you have to verify as an agency, you have to verify yourself as the advertising party on behalf of the clients that you're moving in front of. Uh, I had to do that with Facebook just recently and and uh, Google's asking for the same thing. So are we now as advertisers under, because that that message of who's actually advertising on behalf of this client is gonna be visible, right, Joe? Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm totally on board with that. You know, if there's clearly an agency or a practitioner that's constantly violating rules, then mm -hmm. you're, you're gonna get like for it and eventually you could potentially lose an option to management probably based on your business manager or mcc account sure. um i wish i had in front of me there were certain there was an article i saw this past week about some changes google is making mm -hmm. in terms of that it's kind of like even in terms of just ad accounts in general who are violating the rules there's potentially going to be a three strike and you're out yep type rule coming in and i'm okay with that now now it depends now if it's this machine learning stuff where, where they're looking at it that way and you're falsely getting flagged, I can also see this being absolutely awful. It's but, terrifying. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> so it, it's one of those things where I, I understand, and I know last time I was on, we talked about big issues that they had with YouTube stuff. It, it's These channels are, are so big that it's hard for them to control everything properly. Right. They wanna do what's right from a privacy standpoint to make sure that it's good advertising they do actively block ads and accounts consistently of people trying to mess, you know, with, with the system and mm -hmm. try to game the system, right? which you know, we, we have to do, have to give them some credit that they are trying. Sure. It's just, is it going to have the effects that we want for all the good advertisers that are out there? Yeah. Yeah. But with our advertising agency up front and center in front and right next to the brands that we're representing, usually, I mean, it should be the case that you don't want to represent any brand that that you're not proud of and, and, and mission aligned in, in that respect. But at the same time, you're now indelibly tied to these brands. And if they make a particular mistake out there, guess who's also right in the foxhole with them? That's the agency that's also representing them. And if the, if the agency is the culprit of that misstep or poor rock and roll needle <laughs> combination, right? Yeah, and maybe, yeah. you and, should, and, maybe you should know who the agency was. Yeah. Yeah, but, <laughs> to be it, fair, the agency also said it was good. <laughs> <laughs> they were responding in the Instagram comments that they were like, no, this is really good. Oh, You're like, geez. no, oh, it's not. Oh, man. Oh, yeah, that's sorry, a, sorry. No, that's a, and, and I, I think the branding issues you know, will definitely come into mix in. The audience right now is smart they, yep. and, and they're passionate and they are the most vocal they have ever been. Now, I think of Pride Month, you know, so many companies would change their logos to have rainbow in them. They right. say, we support Pride. And then so many of those companies, you know, they find out that they back politicians or legislations or whatever that are completely against right. what Pride Month is about. And they all got called out. And yep, yep. a lot of, so it, it's one of those things where people are gonna know if you're fake. And if you're fake, that's where you can get a good amount of people not give a crap about your brand ever again. Oh, oh, they'll burn you to the ground. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and you know, that is a cautionary tale because, I mean, we've all se seen uh, reputation management go astray or go awry and people just burn people down on reviews. You know, there is a culpability to the consumers that they have a, a role in this as well. You just can't scream fire against uh, brands that 
that aren't deserving of such ridicule. And I don't want to get into a political soapbox, but I mean, we, we are in this ecosystem together and the companies are adjusting and r relating to the new customer behavior, both from a transactional product standpoint, as well as just the, the digital standpoint we're in because we were all closed down. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a pressure cooker of sorts that can truly flare up regularly. And any company that's out there digitally should also have a policy of crisis management as well because they can step in it inadvertently and i mean all hell can rain down on them yeah i mean <laughs> it's scary uh, when you kind of think about this because you're not going to please everyone right. every tweet every ad whatever it is could be read through a certain lens and could offend someone right yep. but i think as long as you can point back and say hey this represents us, this reflects us, and it also reflects, you know, our customers and be able to point to that and say, okay, you know, like this is this is the stand we're going to take. I think about Nike backing Kaepernick. Yeah. I mean, they made like $5 billion off doing that, right? I mean, that wasn't, yes, it was. It was a net win. You know, it was <laughs> right. making a statement, right? but it was also in very much so impacting their bottom line sure. in saying who we want buying our shoes. Um, and they were okay with doing that. And guess what? I think most of us have probably forgot that that even happened, right? Mm -hmm. So they also know that a lot of this stuff is, you know, it's going to be in the news cycle, 24, sure. 48 hours, maybe a week, and then it's going to blow over, right? Every year, Starbucks gets in trouble for their Christmas-themed coffee mugs, right? <laughs> like, yep. it's... Now, now people just hate Starbucks because they're out of all their favorite drinks because of shipping it. <laughs> yeah, what the hell? That's what it gets down to right there. It's about there products. Give me my, my boba product. tea. Come on. It's product. <laughs> it is product. Mm -hmm. All right. So my, my last leg of this journey, it really is talking about product marketing and uh, demand generation. Um, and it, it, it consumes the outputs of product marketing and injects them into machine you know, marketing machinery that delivers content to prospects at scale consistently. That's what you do on a regular basis, JD. So, so I guess the and, and who you talk to on your podcast. Can you give us a, a a concept of how product marketing can actually work the demand gen team and keep it rolling regularly? Because this is what we're talking about is when it gets down to it, it's not brand alignment. I mean, all those cursory causes as, as hot flash as they are, people need their stuff and they and there has to be a continual funnel creation there. So uh, kind of walk me through the, the product marketing world for us real quick and what we should be looking at in 2021 and 2022. Yeah, I mean, for me, so I came up through the demand gen side of things, mm -hmm. made the transition over into product marketing, and now I'm kind of wearing both hats, right? Yeah, I think one of our friends, she calls this a pie shaped marketer, you know, like the, you know, the, the Greek alphabet pie, you know, oh, got to, you. you know, so, and I think within that thinking through your product marketing is product marketing is really responsible for the product. So mm -hmm. think B2B, think SaaS, really there's a product and they own the marketing strategy for that product. Mm -hmm. And part of that is working with the demand gen team, the demand gen team, you could call them growth marketers, performance marketers, whatever that may be but they should be helping you build the funnel. And so that's helping them with the right messaging. It's helping them with the right content and what content they should create. It's helping them maybe put on a webinar. It's helping them understand who would be a good audience fit for this product. So they know who to go target. Right. It's helping them with writing their ads, You know, working with the design team to come up with what does that image look like. When I was on the demand gen side, the product marketing didn't really exist and we were just winging it. We were having to figure this stuff out. Well, now that you have, I'm hoping if you're out there listening, you have a product marketing team that can help you and they should be helping you to like lead this strategy because ultimately, you know, they're the ones that are, are actually on the line for the success of this product. Mm -hmm. You know, demand gen obviously can help out with, you know, uh, running the in-channel stuff or, you know, putting on, you know, maybe writing some emails or getting the emails out to customers, but uh, work with the product marketing team, on that go-to-market strategy, you know, and then ultimately lean back on them and really push on them to make sure that they're giving you the right messaging, the right audiences. And if you don't have that mature 
product management team, product marketing team, um, it, it can fall like a thud because it's not meeting the consumers where they are, where their needs are. And that's why I wanted to tee up this concept with the the, the, the former concept it is consumers have changed. Their product needs right. have changed. Their consumption has changed. Their alignment has changed. Unless product marketing is recognizing those other dimensions, it's going to be uh, it's going to be one its own echo chamber. But two, uh, it won't meet those new dimensions where it could be very well undiscovered country of incredible lead generation. Right? Yeah, I mean, working at Google, we called it. It's know the magic, know the user, connect the two, cool. and that's what product marketing was responsible for. Was I know the product better than anyone. Well, maybe the outside of product management, but I know it really well. But I'm also responsible for knowing this audience really well. Now it's my job to go help the marketing team, mm -hmm. the sales team, and the customer success team be successful. So demand gen, that could look like generating leads. Sales team is closing those leads. They need pitch decks. They need one pagers. They need battle cards. Success team, they need FAQs. Yep. They need to figure out how to answer these questions or how do I pitch this beta to a perspective like, uh, you know, a really good client, right? Or having you help and answer those questions back and forth. So, yeah, that's where they kind of sit right there in the middle of those three teams. Uh, Joe, thoughts in the product marketing, uh, digital uh, marketing side of things, because there's a whole nother ROAS side, a whole transactional e comm side. Uh, that is the the transactional side of things, but there is a heck of a lot of messaging that goes along uh, that you have to bump the other products out of the way to uh, make room for yourself, right? Yeah, yeah, and kind of kind of relate to what JD already said a little bit, but you know, if anyone reaches out to Michelle or I and you know asks for help or anything, we typically like to tell them is, we're really good understanding the ins and outs of these paid media channels. You know your product better than anyone else. so. Mm -hmm. To work with a product marketer, it, it has to be a really in-depth relationship because kind of like what you said, Aaron, like, yes, we can go in and look at ROAS, we can look at insights, but for the most part, we're looking at that from a very narrow lens of just via the paid media channel. Mm -hmm. I need to know what you're doing from content marketing. Are you doing email marketing? What is the branding for those things? Because if I'm writing ad copy without your permission, yep. if I'm making ads in Canva, or whatever, without your permission, does it align mm -hmm. with what your entire business is doing. So it could be a lot more work than what you think to have your ad campaigns be as successful as you want them to be. And like, you know, what JD said too, it's, it's understanding the audience. If you're really, if the, excuse me, the product marketer, or the product manager is really, has the best perspective on who that target audience is, I need to interview you and, and grill you and say, okay, if I found these targeting options on these mm -hmm. paid social channels, are these it? You know, here are some areas we can expand. Are these the right ones to expand to? You know, or help me out and let me pick the right ones instead of me being like, yeah, that's close enough. It's got it's got the same you know product name in it. Yeah, I'll just toss it in it. It could not be the exact fit. So it, yeah. it's that working relationship and understanding the entire landscape instead of instead of just looking at what the ad platforms are doing, you have to have an idea of the entire landscape. I've gotten to a point now where I want as many eyes and a diverse set of eyes on anything that I write uh, from the get go. There and I just know that one, it's gonna help me, like it'll make me a better writer, it's gonna make the ad better, but it's also, I need to know, how does this resonate with women? How does this resonate with someone in California or someone in New York, right? I mean get that advantage now working remote, but it's like, I need different perspectives and different eyes. And I think even different teams mm -hmm. is super helpful whenever you're trying to write that ad copy, like uh, with, you know, Joe, if you're a demand gen side and you're an agency, like ask, do you have product marketing team? Can we, can we talk with them? Mm -hmm. Right. And cause I can guarantee they're going to have a whole nother layer and probably a deeper layer of insights sure. that you can, um, you know, take advantage of. Very good, very good. Well, I mean, if you operate under the uh, precept that you're bound to piss somebody off initially, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just, just assume that, then then you can get the uh, oversight to be able to protect yourself. All yeah, right. Also true. <laughs> uh, well, we certainly appreciate your insights, gentlemen, and there's lots of lots more things that we can talk about here, but I did want to stop on one thing in particular. You're both pushing media regularly. Outside of your consultancy, you're, you're in there, in the fray, communicating and educating 
and I wanted to hear what your what your what lessons you learned just briefly on uh, JD. You've got a, a successful podcast out there. You're talking to product marketing managers on a regular basis. Joe, you've got a killer uh, YouTube channel, and you're breaking apart tactics. And on top of that, you're kind of putting yourself out there from almost like an evaluation standpoint. If somebody disagrees with what you're doing on a tactic, it's right there and in bold sight. So I mean, that takes some. Gumption, it takes some boldness to be able to tell the audience this is how you need to do this. Uh, what have been lessons learned from your uh, media foyers? Uh, JD, first, go ahead. I think for me, it's knowing that it's never done. I think I've always had, you know, looking back at myself five years from now, like it, it was more black and white. And I think I operate in a little bit more gray now. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe I take more of a growth mindset. You could call it that way of like, we're just going to test. Like, let's just see what happens. Here's the message today. Here's the ad today. Here's the web page. Here's the web copy, whatever that may be. And let's learn from it. And like, it just knowing that it's going to be an iteration, that it's, it's not going to just stay the way it is. It will continually get better. Um, I think that was a, a pretty good learning for me. And then outside of that, I would just say, stay curious, you know, you know, keep that learning mindset. Um, you know, for this role, I had to learn Webflow. I was so used to WordPress when building websites, I had to go learn a whole new platform and mm -hmm. it was trial by fire. And I'm telling you the, for two days, I was just like, <laughs> no, I was at, at my wits end. I was watching so many YouTube videos, but I think just embracing that and, you know, being okay with a little bit of that chaos. And then the last thing I would say I've learned is being okay with just letting some fires burn. Um, you can only put out so many fires. You can only attend to so many fires and you have to be okay with this going, okay, I'm going to do that fire drill, that fire, that fire, and I'm going to let that one burn and let that one burn and <laughs> let that one burn. Um, and I think those have been kind of my big kind of between the podcast and then even in, you know, uh, the last couple of months and in years, those are my, my big learnings and takeaways. You need to learn learn to appreciate the uh, the the trash fire over there, right? That's right. Get a couple. You just gotta s'mores. let it burn. I can't get to that right now. Uh, I gotta deal with this trash yep. fire. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, <laughs> good sentiment there, Joe. What have you learned from the uh, the uh, YouTube production? Yeah, you guys are doing how many shows a week now? Yeah, we have two videos. Two videos a week, week. and we have, we're we're talking about even a little mini podcast thing on our own, plus potentially more courses and stuff. So do it, do it man. Do it. What do we get ourselves into? <laughs> but but you know, it, it, for me, it just came down to fun. I still work on clients. I still love working on accounts. That's mm -hmm. why I got into this industry after you know a, a job that I hated. Um, but my roots came in broadcasting. Yeah, I, they did. I uh, my major was broadcasting at college. For me, it came down to you know doing what I want to do, but shifting my role in a little bit that I can do more of the, the content stuff and talking like this, this is great during my hours and not having to stress myself over client emails, you know, 24 hours a day and at nighttime, it's kind of like that, that mental health thing as well. So that, I think that was just a big part of it of like, even though it's still work related, you know, my kids and my wife still think it's, I'm, I'm doing work, but like oh, editing video, this is fun for me. Like, I love doing this, working on the channel. This is, this is a hobby, a yeah. hobby that, pays me ad money. So, it's like, <laughs> but it, it, I think that is just a, a big factor of yeah. you know, what I learned from the channel. Well, you know, there's going to be, there's people who thumbs down our videos. There's people who, you know, leave comments and everything. It's easy for me to brush off a bit because I'm still doing something I like to do, mm -hmm. but then to have something that practical there too, it's, you know, I've learned to, and I still say it just the way I talk, even though I may not mean it, I would say like, I try not to say like, you always need to do this within your accounts, because we've worked on accounts that are very similar within the same industries, but those accounts perform totally different. Huh. So we, I try not to use like best practice and say, this is the way it should be done because odds are it's, it's definitely not going to work in one account, you know, and kind of going back to what JD says, it comes down to testing. So, you know, our goal with it is not to tell you, this is how you should do it. Our goal with what we're trying to do with content is say, here are the options and the opportunities you have to give you ideas of what you may want to test within your account. And that's kind of where we try to have our tone, even though we might not say it that way all the time. 
Killer. No, you guys are doing a great job. My takeaway is that you just referenced Edge of the Web as a therapy session for Joe Martinez. It, it is. <laughs> it is. See? <laughs> I use it as that because my kids don't want to hear me talk SEO at all. <laughs> yep. Mine are upstairs, and I was like, you're not going to want to come down and get this anyway. So. <laughs> they roll, not... Eyes roll back in their head. They start frothing out the mouth. It's a good thing. Yep. <laughs> well, uh, guys, keep up the good fight and keep on pushing that content out. Um, this is what thought leaders leadership really is, is that uh, you got to kind of put your money where your mouth is. You got to be able to also risk yourself out there as well. Pass on some of the fires that, that you just can't take on and try to do the best work you can and, and connect with people as much as you can, be able to help uh, guide, you know, and share what you've learned along the way. I mean, that's the, that's I guess, the cornerstone that we all share here. So kudos to you guys. And uh, I do appreciate you guys coming on. Um, any final thoughts for the uh, the digital marketing audience out here? We gave the, the preppers some advice. Uh, we got moving consumers. Any thoughts that you want to share uh, to kind of summarize your take here today? Let's get vaccinated so that way we can get out there and have some fun this fall. Um, I don't want to need a fourth wave. So that, <laughs> that fourth wave is going to impact me buying more stuff off Amazon and not caring about brands. Uh, so I, I, I want to go back to really thinking through my next Adidas purchase there you rather go. than my next just like Crocs purchase. You know what I mean? <laughs> so for everybody out there, get vaccinated because JD needs his boba tea and he doesn't want to buy Crocs online. That's right. But, that is but, right. <laughs> but it, but in his thing though, I mean, I'm wearing Adidas right now. So like we talked about sweatpants before. I'm wearing my Adidas boba pants too. So you, you, you meant those, right? You yeah, want to get, yeah, uh, get more, get more Adidas sweatpants. That's right. There you go. <laughs> it comes full circle. Exactly. Uh, Joe, any final thoughts for our audience? Very cliche, but I think the only constant in our industry is that it's not constant. So I, I think you need to, the one thing that has never been true in my industry is keep, keeping the mentality of this is the way it's always done is going to always work. And now, now you, you have to be willing to learn, adjust, move and adapt, whether you're managing the account or your work in-house and you're with the one hiring an agency, you have to understand that things are going to change. Look at what the Facebook privacy thing. We had to change immediately. COVID, we had to change things immediately. And if you're going to push back on it, don't be surprised if you fail. Very good. Very good. Well, gentlemen, again, thank you both uh, for your time today. It's always a pleasure to talk to you guys. It's, it's, it's a uh, great relationship you guys have. And uh, it, it's it's odd to get those marketers together that they don't go after each other like a cage match. So uh, kudos to you guys. And uh, we certainly appreciate uh, your, your time. And uh, we welcome you back down the road as well. And uh, Joe, hit us up in November. We'll have you right here in the seat. OK, I'll be there. Sweet, sweet. All right. Well, that's it for this recording. Thanks so much for uh, the, the time today. And be sure to uh, let us know how we did on this interview as well. Go over to iTunes and give us a review, if you would be so kind. Thanks to our sponsor, uh, Site Strategics. Uh, be sure to check out all the must-see videos and much more over at edgeofthewebradio.com. That's edgeofthewebradio.com. From all of us over here at Edge and Site Strategics, be safe, be well, and do not be a piece of cyber driftwood. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye.